back to Cinema Wellman. I'm your host, David. Today, we're going to take a quick look at the underappreciated genre of the made-for-television movie. Now, nowadays, so many channels out there, so many platforms, everybody's making their own content. What I'm going to do today is take you back to the 70s, really. And I grew up in a time where movies were not readily available. You had the theater, and then you had to wait what seemed like a year before a movie that you missed in the theater would show up uh, cut to ribbons and censored and on one of the three channels, networks, that uh, I got at the time. Um, no cable and no VHS, no VCR until high school. So I had limited uh, opportunities to see films growing up outside of the theater. And... Um, I also grew up in a time when those three channels started to take it upon themselves to produce movies on their own. And this trend began in the mid 60s and I was fortunate enough to enjoy its heyday from the comfort of my own couch. So what follows today are 10 of my favorite uh, made for television movies. Nine of the 10 were made from 1971 and 1979 when I was uh, age nine through 17. So these films hit me early, they hit me hard, and they made an impact, and they were all made for television. Uh, made for TV movies back in the day attracted uh, movie stars, and it was really interesting to see them in on this smaller screen. Um, Peter Finch, Charles Bronson, James Caan, just to mention a few, who were movie stars, uh, and on the silver screen, on the big screen in the theater, and then they're popping up in TV movies. Um, and this was, and later on, people like Kurt Russell, we're going to talk about Kurt Russell today, uh, movies including Jack Warden, John Lithgow, accomplished uh, screen actors making films that are broadcast on TV. I guess the point of, and, and young directors too, uh, uh, one of the films we're going to talk about today was directed by Michael Mann, who went on to uh, direct movies like uh, Heat and uh, Collateral. Um, and another one was was directed by Steven Spielberg. And I don't have to go through that list. Uh, we could start with Jaws, though. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to the point I'm trying to make is that these aren't run of the mill TV movies. Run of the mill TV movies back then when I was growing up were kind of silly. Once in a while, you got a you got a gem. We're not talking Hallmark movies here. We're talking legitimate films that were the ten that I'm going to highlight for you today combined for 40 primetime Emmy nominations and they won 13. Uh, so that's not too shabby by any stretch of the imagination. Unfortunately, only four of the ten are available for screening. And um, if you want to know which ones and where, well, they're all on Amazon Prime for rental. <laughs> but on the blog, uh, you can check that out, cinemawellman.com. And um, there's obviously more information there than is available for me to give you in this short episode. So the films that I'm going to list for you today, they are listed in alphabetical order because they chickened out once again. And there's no way that I'm going to rank them or rate them. They're in chronological order. And uh, a whopping 8 out of the 10 were broadcast on the ABC television network. So whoever was in charge of programming back then, kudos. Uh, you, you had a good run. That was a good stretch. All right, let's start. It's 1971. I am nine years old. And I watched Brian's Song for the first time. And Brian's Song was a milestone film for me. Uh, I loved football, so I wanted to watch it. When it was over, I was kind of surprised because I, I didn't get a football story as much as I got a love story between two guys who were teammates and friends, and and it was it was amazing. So Brian's song uh, tells the story of Brian Piccolo, who was a halfback for the Chicago Bears, and his friendship with his teammate Gail Sayers. Piccolo uh, died of cancer in 1970 at the age of 26, and the the story is is mostly about the friendship and and the relationship and the illness um so i i learned things about football and i also 
learn things about cancer for the first time. And, you know, you come for one thing and you get something else out of it. That's one of the things that movies do for you all the time. The thing I remember most about this movie, though, is crying. And I, I, I cried my eyes out when I was writing the blog. I was tearing up thinking about the emotional impact that Brian's song had on me. I, I think it was the first film that really moved me to tears. And I remember the next day at school uh, talking about watching the movie and admitting that I, I cried. And a bunch of my classmates said that they watched, but they didn't cry. Yeah, I, liars. <laughs> what do you have, no soul? <laughs> All right, next on the list is from 1983. And this is chronologically speaking, the last of the 10 films that we're going to talk about today. And this is The Day After. Now, I was a junior at Boston University when this came out. All the other ones, I was, you know, living at home. Uh, this one, I was in college already. And, and The Day After, broadcast in 1983, is kind of what I view as the end of what I always consider the TV movie. Right around this time is when HBO started flexing their muscles and making their own movies. HBO was around for a little bit and was showing, you know, theatrical films. And then mid-80s, they started making their own. And when that happened, it seemed like, uh, you know, the other uh, Showtime followed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The cable networks followed with uh, producing their own films. And the networks, it seemed, were just willing to let that go. And they never really felt the need to compete with it. It was also when I, I think um, reality shows started to come in and then they said we could either produce our own films, which cost a boatload of money, or we could do reality shows, which are uh, cost little to nothing. And and I like I said, the day after is is where I think it kind of splits off and the end of the TV movie. Um, the day after uh, is about... Uh, the nucle a nuclear war between ourselves and the Soviet Union or Russia, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> and um, it was broadcast <laughs> right smack dab in the middle of the Cold War. And it took an ultra realistic look at nuclear war. And it, it blew people's minds while collectively scaring the shit out of them. Um, originally aired on November 20th, 1983. <laughs> hey, happy Thanksgiving. Um, remains the most watched TV movie in U.S. history. An estimated 100 million Americans watched it. At the time, the population in the United States was 234 million. 100 million out of 234 million people in the United States watched the day after. This, that's mind-boggling viewership. That is impossible nowadays. So much content, you're never going to get that many eyes in the same spot anymore. Um, this wasn't just a movie. This was an event. There were a lot of uh, news reports and magazine articles about it before. Uh, no commercial time was shown after the nuclear war broke out in the movie. So the second half of the film was aired commercial free, which made it seem like more of a theatrical movie. ABC set up special 1 800 hotlines for people to call if they got upset about the film. Um, and the day after airing, uh, it was the only topic of conversation. I don't care workplace, college classrooms, I'm sure down to the high school level, grade schools. It got everybody thinking about the possibilities and the horrors of nuclear war if we weren't already thinking about it. So, this is a perfect example of how a film sometimes is able to do more than entertain or even educate, it, it opened up dialogues uh, centering around what was at the time the elephant in the room. Uh, the day after, it, it was tremendous. Like I said, it wasn't just a movie. It was, it was a television event. Um, and like I mentioned, what I think is the end of what I considered the TV movie. Next on our list is uh, from 1975, not airing on the ABC network. This one was NBC. And it, it's titled The Deadly Tower. Um, if you're a friend of Cinema Wellman and you've been reading and keeping up with the episodes, uh, you know that the top 10 for July featured a film titled Tower, which was an animated documentary 
about Charles Whitman and the events of August 1st, 1966. This made-for-TV movie from 1975, when I was 13 years old, tells the same story. Here's Kurt Russell portraying Charles Whitman. Um, and I know that I mentioned this when I was speaking about Tower, but just to fill you in again, uh, after killing his mother and his wife, Whitman went to the observation deck of the Clock Tower building uh, at the University of Texas at Austin campus and began uh, shooting. And in the, in the next 96 minutes, before Whitman was shot and killed by police officers, uh, he had killed 15 people and wounded 31. This is a very sad story, especially if you take the extra step and do some reading. Um, you know, you would say, okay, here's a monster. Here's a man who killed his mother and his wife, and then he he shot and killed indiscriminately 15 people and, and, and wounded scores. And... Um, so you think evil, horrible thing. You read about this guy, and he had some serious mental issues, and he also had some serious, it turns out, physical issues. And he was tormented by, he didn't know what to do. His, his goal was getting killed by the police. One of the notes that he left um, stated that he wanted an autopsy done, especially on his brain, to see if there was any. So it's a really, it's a, it's a sad story. And it's a terrifying film. Um, and I think, you know, I was 13. I think this was my introduction to mass shootings, which have unfortunately become part of our everyday lives. That's a, that's a tough one. That's The Deadly Tower from 1975. Uh, next on the list, uh, Duel from 1971. And I can't help but smile thinking about this film because... Um, if you look at the, on the blog, I put the uh, the page from the TV guide, and it's got a close up. They called it a close up, and it's got this uh, synopsis of Duel, which is tremendous. And that's what the TV guide used to do. I love that. I could do a whole episode on the TV guide, but it's not about movies. Um, there are well, let me talk about TV guide for a couple minutes. <laughs> there are so many good memories I have about that little book uh, coming into my household, and you know that first day that you get it. And sometimes you got it on the Thursday before, uh, you know, you got it like a, almost a week in advance. It was great. Um, sports stuff in there was unbelievable. No internet. That's all I'm going to say. The TV guide was phenomenal. It was just one of my best friends. Um, if you look at the poster for Duel, you'll say, hey, that looks like Jaws. Well, there's a reason why somebody did that. And it's because this film on TV was directed by Steven Spielberg, friend of Cinema Wellman, Steven Spielberg. Um, this is a story about road rage. Dennis Weaver plays an everyman guy who is out on the road and he is terrorized by, as the ad says, 10 tons of rolling death. This driver of a, a 18 wheeler is harassing him and tailgating him. And it's, it's, it's crazy. It, it, it's just really something, it's just like, you are, it, this is white knuckle stuff, and this is what I refer to as one of those WWYD movies. Like, what would you do? You're you're in your car, this guy, you, you can't pull over, you can't do this, you can't do this, can't do that, can't do this. It's, it's really good. And it's easy to say now, but I remember watching this and, and thinking to myself, that, that wasn't a regular TV movie. There's something different about that. And it turns out that difference was Steven Spielberg. So you never know who you're going to get when you tune into a TV movie. Speaking of which, next on the list from 1979 is The Jericho Mile. And The Jericho Mile uh, starred Peter Strauss. Peter Strauss was one of the stars, along with Nick Nolte, of ABC's very successful miniseries from 1976, Rich Man, Poor Man. And I love that miniseries, and I love Nick Nolte, and I love Peter Strauss. So when I saw that Peter Strauss was going to be in this TV movie about this prisoner who's a long-distance runner, I was like, this is going to be great. This is going to be fantastic. And again, easy to say now, but I remember watching this and thinking to myself, this is different. What is it? Is it the cinematography? Is it the shot selection? Is it the, is it the music and the way the music's? used in the film, whatever it was, it turned out that that whatever was, it was directed by Michael Mann. And 
his signature, like Spielberg's signature that you can see on films, it, it came through. The Jericho Mile was was phenomenal. I uh, I thought it was just wonderful. It's an underdog story. So here's this prisoner, and he's so good that he is uh, considered uh, for an Olympic tryout. It's it's fantastic. Really good stuff. And Michael Mann. Uh, next on the list is from 1974. So I'm 12 years old, and a little full disclosure here: this movie's not very good. So the other ones that I I've I've talked about so far. And if you go on the blog, you'll see that I've mentioned, you know, if it got uh, Emmy nominations and if it won Emmys, things like that. Um, this is really the first one that's, all right, I'll admit, it's not very good. Um, it's not a film that's dealing with an, a, an important social issue or personal triumphs or personal tragedies or anything like that. This would go under the, in the file of guilty pleasures. Uh, but I included it because this is an example of what a majority of TV movies were like. Um, they weren't all like Duel and Brian Song, believe me. Um, this movie stars Robert Reed, William Shatner, Marjo Gortner, and Andy Griffith. So, it's 1974, and I tuned in to watch this to see Mike Brady, Captain Kirk, Captain Cocaine, Marjo, Marjo Gortner, and get hunted for sport in the desert by Sheriff Andy Taylor. So that's that's the only reason why I tuned into this. Anytime you feature the world's most dangerous game in your plot line, I am interested. This is no exception. Fun to see, you know, Reed and Shatner and Griffith play something other than the iconic TV characters that I saw every week on on the small screen. Uh, strictly popcorn fare, and there's really nothing wrong with that. Anytime. <laughs> Next, from 1976, is, uh, and this was the, uh, the only other one that was not aired on ABC. This is from NBC. So ABC had 10 of these, NBC had two, CBS just watching. Um, so Radon and Tebby is an example of, or it get, gives me a chance to mention that Sometimes TV movies were made in the United States and they were then shipped overseas to play in theaters. This was an example of that. All you have to do is look at the movie poster and you can see, well, that doesn't look like a, that looks like a movie poster, movie poster. That doesn't look like something that was on TV. And then you look and you say, wait, who's in this? Peter Finch? Is it Peter Finch, Charles Bronson, Yafet Koto? These are, these are movie people. These aren't TV people. Um, but again, that's one of these things that these films, these made for TV films, some of them stand up against regular films easily. Um, Radon Entebbe details the true story of a daring Israeli commando assault on the Entebbe airport in Uganda to free hostages of a terrorist hijacking. Now, back in the, in the 70s, Airplane hijackings were a big thing. I, I don't mean like all the kids are doing it. I just mean that it seemed like every day on the news, you'd hear something about a hijacking or a, or a plane being diverted or, or something. It was really, really a, an odd time. And it was really uh, interesting to see that this film uh, took a story straight out of the headlines. And, and it was, you know, you got a lot of viewership. This is something that, wait, this just happened. And now there's a film about it, so you're going to get more eyes on it. Uh, tense thriller, really good performances, including Yafet Kodo as Idi Amin. That you should see. <laughs> Next, we have from 1973, Shirts and Skins. And if you heard that and your blood ran cold, I uh, joined the club. So this is 1973. I'm in fifth grade. When you're a fifth grade boy with uh, low self-esteem and little athletic talent, there are two words that will turn your blood to ice cold when you hear them, and they are shirt skins. Now, okay, I'm going to be the la one of the last ones picked. I'm certainly not going to do anything to help your team, so please spare me the indignity and the added embarrassment of also having to remove my shirt to play the game of basketball. <laughs> so when when I saw 
an advertisement for this. I was just like, I got to get in on this because these are grownups. These aren't kids in a gym class. Um, I recognize a lot of the cast and I like them. Bill Bixby, Doug McClure, McLean Stevenson, Ron Glass, Loretta Swit. So I knew I was going to watch this. Um, what I didn't know is I didn't realize how much I was going to enjoy it. I remember reenacting scenes from it the next day with my friends in the playground. And I also, we also did that. We reenacted the rumble from West Side Story after we saw that movie. How, how was I not a theater kid? That will always puzzle me. Um, as the synopsis to Shirt Skins reads, uh, it all starts out as a friendly game, but it ends in a bitter dispute. It's comedy. That's dark comedy at times. And it kind of kind of show you what happens when a j joke can go too far on you. Uh, Shirt Skins from 1973. Next, also from 1973, Trapped, also known as the, uh, the what was it, the, out, the something amazing Dobermans, something about dogs, because, and this is another what would you do movie, James Brolin plays a man who's accidentally locked in a department store overnight and is forced to deal with the store's security system, which happens to be a pack of Doberman pinchers. Uh, so nothing important here, kind of like Pray for the Wildcats if you want to sort these out a little. Um, just tense, entertaining, action-packed 90 minutes. Brolin tries to outsmart the dogs who are bent on his destruction. Um, was this common? I worked at a department store when I was in high school. I worked at Caldors. I do not remember a security staff of bloodthirsty dogs. And the promo, who is putting Trapped after Brian's song? What is going on there? I gave credit to ABC before, but wow, that's a bad move. And here we go. Here's the final one for us today when we look through TV movies of note. It's from 1975, and it's titled Trilogy of Terror. So this was a TV movie, a horror movie, that was split up into three different tales, hence trilogy. Um, this was off the charts lunacy. And this was talk about talking at school the next day. The very first topic of conversation was, oh my God, did you see Trilogy of Terror last night? Karen Black is in it. She's all over this. She plays, in these three stories, four different roles. And all four are tormented women. Um, so there's three stories, and be totally honest, I don't remember the first two. And I don't think anyone else who watched this remembers the first two. The only one we all remember is the last segment, and that was the one with the little creepy doll. So... The last piece in this trilogy was titled uh, Amelia. And in it, uh, Karen Black plays a woman who's terrorized by this little Zuni uh, fetish doll. And she's the only person in the entire piece. It reminded me of, you ever see the old Twilight Zone with Agnes Moorhead? And she's the only person in the whole episode. And she's being uh, tormented by these little spacemen. It's fantastic. There's no dialogue in that Twilight Zone episode. Um, it kind of reminded me of that. This had dialogue, but... Um, the special effects might, you know, you might go, eh, pale. they pale in comparison to today. But I got to tell you, that little guy, he, he, little, he scared the hell out of us. And we that's all we were talking about the next day. That little Zuni guy. Eh. All right. That's going to do it. Just wanted to share that with you. Run down, little stroll down memory lane. Got me doing some research and reading about and writing about old movies I hadn't seen in a while. Um, I also on the... On the, uh, on the blog, because I wanted to kind of rationalize or kind of say, listen, uh, validate is the word I'm looking for. I wanted to validate my choice of these 10. So I put the IMDB ratings uh, and they're all, they're all pretty good. Pray for the Wildcats only got a 6.2, but the other ones are really good. Um, so that is it. Join us next time on Cinema Wellman. Uh, and in the meantime, Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. That's at Cinema Wellman. Read the blog. I already mentioned that. That's cinemawellman.com. You can listen to us on Spotify. You can watch us on YouTube. And if you want to email me, uh, you can always email me here at cinemawellman at gmail.com. Next week for you, we are. Uh, it's that time of the month. We're going to do our monthly top 10, bottom five. We're going to rack up October for you. So until then, take care.